Hi guys, hi guys. This is Dr. T speaking um, from Clinical Medicine with Dr. T. Um, welcome to this episode and welcome to those who are watching for the first time. Um, please guys remember to like, comment, subscribe and share. Um, it's going to help us a lot going forward. Um, so what I want to do now, I want us to talk about um, so we're starting an author series. So we're gonna do uh, lower limbs, but we're gonna break um, we're gonna break those starts into small small um, pieces. So today I wanna talk about um, neck of femur fractures. So neck of femur. Fractures. Um, so neck of femur fractures. Let's just briefly talk about the blood supply there. So this is our acetab acetabulum. This is our neck. And then so and then this is our this is our so like that. So that's our left femur so the blood supply there we know we've got these two major arteries so we've got um put them in red so so we've got here the the common femoral artery that branches into the the deep and the superficial the fish superficial femoral artery goes down the legs and then the superficial goes and then it branches to to the you know i should have just put it here can i just put let me just put it here okay sorry so we've got our um, so let's say it branches from here then this one goes like that so we've got um, uh, our me our lateral circumflex artery and our so the neck the the, the neck of femur is supplied by two arteries the the medial circumflex artery and the lateral circumflex artery which just goes like that the other one goes like that so as they branch from this they branch from this i'm bad with, with drawings guys um so so basically we've got uh something like this something like this so there we've got the lateral circumflex and the medial circumflex, some circumflex. And then uh, we've got descending branches and, and the ascending branches of these two arteries. So, so that's what we have. So um, that's the blood supply. It's very important to understand it here. So neck of femur fractures are divided into they can either be let's put a line here they can either be intracapsular intracapsular or they can be extra capsular extra cap capsular extra capsular fractures are uh, your your intertrochanteric intertrochanteric fracture or your subtrochanteric subtrochanteric and also you can also have isolated trochanteric fractures isolated when a fracture okay let's make another diagram so anything that is above here is a an intracapsular fracture it's within the capsule of the joint and anything that is below this 
is the is a is an extra capsular fracture. So the types that we have just mentioned, if a fracture, an isolated trochanter fracture, if you only break this or you only fracture that, that's an isolated greater trochanter fracture. If you only fracture this, that's an isolated lesser trochanter fracture. And then you can also fracture, you can also have a fracture that connects these two. They go like that or they go like that. So that's a, that's a, an intertrochanteric, intertrochanteric fracture. But if you've got a fracture that is below the lesser trochanter, then that's a subtrochanteric fracture. Those are the four fractures that you get here. Number one, number two, number three. These ones are two moves. It's the it can either be the lesser trochanteric fracture or a greater trochanteric fracture. So those are those are sub trochanteric fractures. So you know, um, orthopedics. It's important to know classifications and and the name of fractures because when you when you call an orthopod, it's always nice to say exactly what the patient has. If I call an orthopod and then I, I tell them that I've got a neck of femur fracture, I don't classify it. I don't, I just label these as neck of femur fractures. It's like I've not said anything. And they will start now to ask questions and ask pictures and all those kind of things. But if you call them, um, the conversation or the, 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 the discussion will be very short and very sweet. Because you just say, Doc, I've got an intertrochanteric fracture. They will tell you exactly what to do. Oh, I've got a subtrochanteric fracture. They'll tell you exactly what to do. Um, so it's important to know classifications of fractures. It's not enough to just know that there is a fracture. You need to know because when you know the classification, it's easy to manage the patient because classifications are there for a reason. They were not just um, formulated for for fun. They've got a reason. Like uh, like now, I'm gonna uh, we're gonna talk about like for instance, you know. Let, for instance, a Weber, a Weber classification. If you call an orthopod and then you say you've got a, you've got a Weber A um, ankle fracture, it's different when you say to him you've got a Weber C. He knows exactly what a Weber C is. And he knows exactly, for instance, a Weber A, you can put a POP on that patient, put a back slab for a week, they come back for a full POP, and then they go and, re, and then they can even come back to you and then you remove it after eight weeks or whatever or 12 feet, whatever the case may be. So, but if you say Weber C, a Weber C by definition is supposed to be operated on because there's syndesmosis injury there. So, so things like that. So just saying to an orthopod, I've got an ankle fracture, is just making everyone's life difficult. Um, you make your life difficult and you make his life difficult. So, and then now, so, Intracapsular fractures are fractures that are above this line. So it can be your capital fractures or your head of the femur fractures or the neck. The classical neck of femur fractures is fractures that happen here. That's where the classical neck of femur fractures. But they still call these neck of femur fractures. But when you, like I said, when you talk to, to an orthopod, you need to, 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 to say exactly. Um, what's happening? So, um, okay, let's just move this. So we have said that you have this head. You've got this. You've got this. You've got this. And you've got. You've got and then you've got this. And like we said that, so. We've spoken about this. So let's talk about now the intracapsular fractures. The intracapsular fractures are the ones that are more problematic in the sense that they are exactly where they've got a, an, a, a potential to damage your blood supply to the neck of to the neck of femur and also to the head. Uh, remember there's an artery here, which is called the fovea of your artery that supplies the, the, the head. So the neck can still be fine, but I mean the, the head can still be fine because there's an extra supply of, an, of, a, of, a, of blood. But the neck itself is dependent on the medial circumflex and the lateral circumflex. 
So if you have got a fracture here, you've got a chance of damaging both of those um, circumflex arteries. So that's why intracapsular fractures have got a risk of a vascular necrosis. These ones, they don't have that kind of a risk. A vascular necrosis. So neck, uh, neck of um, your classical intercapsular fractures. These are all neck of femur fractures, but now the difference is: are they intra intracapsular or or extracapsular? So your intracapsular fractures can either be your head. It's not uh, it's not unusual for a patient to fracture only the head. Of the of, of 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 the of the femur, so you can have capital fractures, which are your head fractures, or you can have your your neck involved, your actual neck involved. So neck of femur fractures, the intracapsular fractures, have got a classification called the garden classification. When you call an orthopod say, doc, I've got um, intercapsular fracture, neck of, the neck of femur fracture, intercapsular fracture, that in four classification, he knows exactly what you're talking about. When you've got a, a, a garden classification, garden classification, there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. A one is a fracture of the head that is incomplete. It's a fracture of the neck, sorry, that is incomplete. So it's a, the fracture is there, but it's incomplete. There's no displacement. Incomplete, no displacement. But once you move here to this side, you have a fracture that is complete. So it's a complete fracture there. But no displacement. But once you come this side, you have a fracture. Let me just draw it this way. So you've got a fracture and then you've got a bit of displacement there. So you've got a bit of displacement there. And then when you come to this one, You've got a fracture and you've got complete displacement there. That's your garden classification. The, the this classification really also it, it, it helps you determining your avascular necrosis, the chances. Avascular necrosis is much is more um possible or is uh, is more possible with the further you go with your garden classification uh, the the riskier it becomes for a vascular necrosis so the risk of getting a vascular necrosis becomes high as you go this is like the worst these two are the worst because as you get displacement you can get that snapping of those um circumflex arteries so there's a, a risk there. Here there's also a risk, but it's very minimal with these two. It's worse with these ones. Né? So, so that's with, with the garden classification. So now, why do people get uh, neck of femur fractures? Neck of femur fractures, in the young people, and in the old, it's different. A young person that is gonna is gonna get a neck of femur fracture. It means that it means that there is a, a like, um, it's a high. So with them, it's a high energy injury, but with these ones, it's more of pathological. You know, osteoporosis not being. Uh, being postmenopausal, not no longer getting est estrogen. You know, estrogen plays a very important role in strengthening women's bone. So, so it's a pathological fracture in the old, but in the young, it's a high energy injury, meaning MVAs, 
pedestrian vehicle accidents, um, fall from height. These are the most, and also gunshot. These are high energy um, sort of injuries. So, which means now, when you get a young uh, patient with a neck of femur fracture, it means that you must look at other injuries as well because it could have been an MVA, a PVA, or a fall, meaning they are, they've got chances that something there's something else happening. Meaning, you must check their GCS, see if they don't have a changes in, the, in their GCS, confusion, vomiting, which is a sign that they might be having bleeding in the brain and examine the chest, see if they've got rib fractures. If they're not in distress, they are having maybe a hemo or a hemothorax or a hemothorax. And also examine properly the abdomen to see if they don't have abdominal injuries or maybe they are having internal bleeding, things like that. And examine all the other bones, do a cyst spine, and actually that should do the whole, if, especially if it's a fall. Yeah, well, if it's a fall. So... Be mindful of these ones. These are your young patients. An old patient, however, the approach is slightly different. Yes, there is this theory that for them, you don't need you don't need excessive force for them to fracture. Minimal force will do because the bones are weak. Now I think they are able to fracture and then fall. Sometimes they 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 fall because they're fractured. By just standing up and walking, they can just a fracture their bones that's how weak um the, their bones can 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 become so if an elderly woman fell and then they fractured you want to know why did they fall is it because where they stay there's the environment is is, is full of hazards are the cords around or did they step on a shoe or did they trip on something and then they fell or did they have like syncope or um, what happened before they fell and all those things? Because they could have fallen because of cardiac problems. Maybe they got an arrhythmia or maybe they became short of breath. Or So you want to treat these women with caution in, in the sense that you need to look at other things as well. Were they dehydrated? Are they having electrolyte um, um, imbalances? So doing UNE, all those things in ECG and just checking what other medication that they're taking is very good. Especially if they're taking diuretics, they could have become uh, um, hypokalemic or maybe they're hypokalemic because of the halasics that they are taking and then now they fail. Remember, hypokalemia makes you to be very weak and then you can become weak and then you fall or you can't even wake up from the bed or you try to wake up, so things like that. So you want to look at their medical history and see, is there something that you can correct or maybe did they get a stroke or a TIA or what's happening? So that's what you want. So now let's come to the management of these patients. Um, the management of these patients your goal is to number one okay okay they will present how will they present they will present with the history look at the now already the history is different because this one there will be injury there will be uh, some sort of uh, an event like i explained and not all neck of femur fractures patients they present with a leg that is externally rotated and shortened the shortening and all those things, is a plus or minus. Any patient who's got a, a groin pain and uh, they've been involved in an accident, just do a pelvic X-ray. Um, even if the leg is not rotate, is not externally rotated or is not shortened, because you get shortening if there's displacement. If there's no displacement, you won't get short uh, shortening. And uh, if you suspect an in, a, a, a pelvic fracture on a patient that uh, that fell even if it's an an elderly woman you suspect when you when you examine them there's tenderness there that is like um not in proportion or is not controlled by your meds you might want to do uh, and then you do an x-ray but there's nothing you might want to do an mri there 
to make sure that um and the films that we get that you must you must check is your lateral and your ap remember the the in orthopedics there is this thing called a rule of two a rule of two says that patients need to have um two x-rays if you're gonna do a reduction or whatever you need to do a first x-ray and after under after reduction do a second x-ray and also you need two views you need an ap and a lateral i've seen fractures that um i've had instances where i would pick up a fracture on the lateral that i couldn't pick up on the ap so it's very important sometimes you can pick up a fracture on the ap but when you look at the lat lateral it's like the displacement is so much even though you couldn't see it you couldn't appreciate it on the ap but the displacement is like so much on the lateral and um, try to refuse interpreting x-rays that do not show two joints um where i work currently we've got a problem of that that of that we send patient for x-rays but we don't get two joints so we need the joint above and the joint below and why is that for instance with galliate fracture if you've got a fracture and a dislocation if you don't see the two joints then you will miss the dislocation and you'll manage only the fracture especially if you didn't pick up clinical that the patient has got dis dislocation so that's why it's important to get those two views two x-rays two views and uh, two joints involved so that's that so when you manage this patient your priority now there is analgesia you need to control the pain you give analgesia and analgesia of choice your opioids obviously if there are no contraindications like your tramadol your morphine you need to control that pain remember in fractures it's not as advisable to give NSAIDs because the first um, phase or the first steps of healing is inflammation so those are anti-inflammatories so you will delay their healing if you use your, your NSAIDs in any fracture you will delay their healing so try and use tramadol and paracetamol when you've got uh, patients with fractures so you want to control the pain you want to to splint these patients you want to put them on traction i mean you want to put them on traction skeletal traction is no longer done so the only option is skin traction number three as you admit these patients you want to give them a prophylaxis so that they don't develop um thrombosis or thromboembolism so you give them the clexin at a prophylactic dose um and then you want to so you want to so you want to give them those things then they go to the ward you want to insert a catheter as well because they will be immobile so you'll catheterize them and um, let's talk about uh, complications of these fractures now. Complications of necrofemur fractures. Yes, you can have AVN, avascular necrosis, especially from a garden uh, three and four. You can have this, and you can have. Um, you can have a fat emboli one two three especially if it's your if it's your subtrochanteric and your intertrochanteric fractures you can have a fat emboli then um you can also have you can also develop dvt because they will be immobile that's why we give them clexane they can develop dvt that will end up being a pe because you have because they are not mobile and you've inserted a catheter so they they run a risk of getting a, a uti and because they are in hospital they can run a chance of getting nosocomial infections like pneumonia um uh, what else I'm not sure what I'm forgetting in terms of complications. 
I know they are a lot. They also run a risk of getting pressure sores. Pressure sores or bad sores. And the only way to manage this, to prevent it, is to do those for hourly bed turns. Um, but, 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 but what other complications? You guys will remind me about other complications, ne? But there isn't much you can do about AVN uh, because likely, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen when they fracture. And if there's another movements that happens the patient is not mobile is not sitting on the bed is moving around over there they can they can still get that um and then a pe we we gave we gave we gave, we give them trexane uti you will ask about it whenever you see the patient you can do dipstick every three days and then as for your pneumonia you will always ask them how are they feeling They'll tell you if I'm, 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 I'm short of breath, if I'm, I'm having a, I'm coughing and all those things. Let's talk about uh, an embolus, a PE. A PE. This is the number one killer in terms of patient, when it comes to patients with long bone fractures. So you have this patient that has been in the ward, they are fine, there's nothing. But for whatever reason, maybe the clexane was not prescribed or whatever, or it was... I don't know if... Maybe I need to check this. What are the chances of getting an embolus um, when you are already on clexane? I need to check those things and see what are the chances. So if you've got a patient... I want us to diagnose a patient to make a spot diagnosis of uh, of an embolus, um, whatever embolus it is, be it a be it a clot, a thrombo, or a fat embolus. So you get this patient that has been fine the whole day, then you are called to the ward that the patient is distressing. You go there and patient is dropping sets. And um, you know that this patient has been well the whole day. You saw them during the day, they were well, they didn't have any complaints. But now, all of a sudden, they get this. It's likely to be an embolic event. You can do an ABG then. When you do an ABG, you check the PF ratio. PF ratio. A PF ratio, basically, you take the partial pressure of oxygen, which is supposed to be 80 to 100, and you divide it with uh, an FiO2. If the patient is on room A, the FiO2 there is 21%. Then if you are giving patient um, whatever, maybe 50% or 40%, so that would be your IF2. So when you calculate this, when you calculate this, remember this is a percentage. So in order for you to, de to de let's say the IFIO2 of the patient is um, 100. I mean the partial pressure is 100. You divide that by, by uh, the patient is on 21%. So that would be 21 divided by 100. And then that would be, that would be 1, 2, that would be 0, 0,21. And then you get the answer, whatever the answer it is. I'm not good with math, guys. Eh? Whatever the answer is. So, but what you want to know is if it's less than 300, then that patient is having an acute uh, oxygen, oxygen, um, is having a, a, an obstruction somewhere. So the likely obstruction is your is your is your clot or your fat. Because remember, these are your alve if these are your alveolar, and then this is your blood vessel, your FIO2 is fine. Your FIO2 is fine because it's at 21%. So you are delivering oxygen. But now the partial pressure, this is the FIO2, this side, FIO2. And then this is your partial pressure in the blood of O2. 
if now you are giving enough FiO2, but your partial pressure, for instance, is um, is low, obviously it won't be low if it's that high. If so, your PF ratio is low, then it means that you are giving oxygen well, but the partial there's a on there's an obstruction. So your your um, your delivery and your and your absorption there's a problem with that. So probably you are having an obstruction of one of these so much that you are not you are not the cells are not getting what you are delivering basically. So you find that now your PF ratio will be less than three hundred. So you should be worried. Once it's less than fifty, then there's a big 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 problem. So this is like your something you can use as your spot, even though. But the P, the P, like I'm saying, there are other things that can cause your PF ratio to be, um, to be low. But if a patient, if it's a patient that has been asymptomatic the whole day, but now all of a sudden they get um, acute respiratory distress and then you do their PF and then it's that low, then you can put your money on, on a, in an embolic event. But if the patient has had has been having a respiratory problem, then it becomes difficult to interpret it. Um, so remember the PF ratio. Um, so guys, I'm not an orthopod. I'm just a general practitioner. But there are, in terms of the, the operative management of these patients, remember, whether you are going to operate a patient, young patients should be operated because they are likely to not have comorbidities. They are likely to be contributing. Um, they are likely to be breadwinners. They are likely to be contributing in the economy of the country. And then so you want to get them up and going as quick as possible. So these ones are usually operated. But an uh, an an elderly uh, patient, an old patient who's got a many, a lot of comorbidities and uh, they cannot uh, withstand long operations. They, those patients, it's very hard to decide. If you cannot even um, optimize their comorbidities and make sure that they are they are well before you take them to theater. Some of them might wait and wait and wait and never even go to theater. So there are so many things that you you look at before you can operate. But basically, um, they are um, okay. When it comes to arthroplasty, it can either be a hemi or a, a total. When you have an a, when you've got a hemi arthroplasty. It means that you are only replacing the the head, the neck and the head of the femur, but not the acetabulum. That's a hemiarthroplasty. But if you are doing a total hip replacement, it means you are replacing the head and the neck and also the acetabulum. Other options that are available is your cannulated, uh, you've got... Um, uh, okay, so you've got your cannulated uh, screws, which you can put them like that. You see, your fracture is here. You put those. There are normally three of them. So I'm not an orthopod guide, but this is just like a, a brief, brief kind of a thing. And I'm gonna be doing my ortho by the end of this year, November, December. That's when I'll be doing my ortho. So I think I'll have more information then. But basically, this is this, and also. Um, with the elderly patients, anything can go wrong while they are still waiting for operation. Anything, they can start to have electrolyte imbalances. They can start to have, a, they can become delirious, and then now you need to find out why are they delirious. You remember, um, dim top things that can cause a patient to be delirious. So you need to check their urine, check for infection in the chest, pneumonia, check, check for extra imbalances, check. So, so there are, those are the things that can also happen. Like a patient that's just, 
they just become delirious in the world while they are just sitting there and then they start becoming delirious so you need to be aware that those are the other complications that you can get with the neck of femur fractures um and these patients especially the young ones the longer they are kept in the hospital the harder it's gonna be for them to get up and walk again even though they've been operated because remember once you don't use your muscles they become weak and then they forget how to help you to walk so they will need a extensive a long extensive physio um so it's nicer to get them up and walking in other centers they recommend that these patients should be operated within 24 hours yeah so guys that's with a uh, neck of femur fractures if i'm forgetting anything you are free to comment and uh, let's talk about it thank you